Cybercrime is the world's third biggest economy. Every company is affected. This is big, important stuff. And nobody's taking this seriously. Jeremy, you are downloading an app. Suzanne, what do you do? Jeremy, no! Oh. Ah! Ah! How useful was it? Uh, zero use. Fun, though. Really hurt him, I think. <laughs> Orange Cyber Defense. Well, hello everybody and uh, welcome to this webinar on the Orange Cyber Defense Security Navigator 2024. Um, my name is Charles van der Valt. I'm the head for security research here at Orange Cyber Defense. And um, myself and my team are largely responsible for producing our annual Security Navigator report. Uh, which is what we'll be talking about today. Uh, we put a lot of effort, a lot of love, a lot of blood, sweat and tears goes into uh, getting that report out um, by a, a huge team across the business. And so, uh, and so we're really excited to be able to talk with you about it today. It's, it's, um, it's our pleasure to host you uh, for this discussion about the report and, uh, and what it means to you. Um, the Security Navigator, as I said, is our annual report in which we try and uh, collect and synthesize the data, the, the experience, the insights that we glean uh, from our work as a, as a security service provider, as an integrator, um, and, and uh, translate that into insights and understanding that we hope will be uh, useful to you, the people who, who read it. Uh, but it's a it's a big product. It runs at about 180 pages, um, and so the purpose of this webinar is to share with you some thoughts from uh, our perspective about uh, what's in the report, how um, how you can get value from the report, um, and then most importantly to give you an opportunity to talk with our experts. Uh, about the, the the themes, the topics, the assertions that are made in in the Security Navigator. Uh, so this is a webinar that is for you, um, and it's an opportunity for you to to speak to uh, the people who are really responsible for for putting that report together. Um, and uh, and so here's the the structure that we want to follow. Uh, we want to talk with you very briefly just about how the report fits together and um, how uh, how you can get value from it. Um, I've got some some questions for the panelists about some of the, the key themes in the report, but then we hope to to really quite quickly get to a point where you can start asking us questions. Uh, and really, it's a, a kind of ask me anything session. Um, we're here to talk about the report, so um, you know, let's keep it to that. But um, if you have questions about the, the the report itself or themes in the report, uh, then we will do our best to try and answer that for you. Um, and in that spirit and for that purpose, I'm joined by a, a panel of experts. Um, some of my favorite people within the business that I that I get to work with a lot and who I think are very well positioned um, to handle your questions. So let me uh, introduce them to you. Um, uh, firstly, joining us from the Netherlands is uh, Jort Kollery. He's a strategic advisor in our, in our Netherlands office, uh, you know, responsible for really translating the findings of the Navigator into actual insights uh, for our customers. Uh, Simone Kraus, based in Germany, uh, is a, a security analyst, really a, a threat intelligence and threat detection um, expert. She, uh, she's attached to our CyberSoc in Germany as a consultant there and uh, joins us, as I said, from Germany. Catherine Bodie is, uh, joins us from the UK, Catherine, or South Africa today, I'm not sure. 
Um, she's At responsible UK for our UK Today. Yeah, UK Catherine Today. moves between uh, between Africa and the UK because she runs our uh, vulnerability operations center for uh, the UK and for uh, Africa. Uh, and then a very close friend and colleague of mine, Diana self Paulson. She's a security researcher, criminologist by trade, by education, sorry, and um, and and one of the people largely responsible for uh, the analysis that you'll find in the navigator. Uh, and then finally, joining us from Belgium, uh, also a very close friend of mine, Simon van der Peer, another strategic advisor um, who is uh, constantly at the cold face of advising our customers. Uh, how to apply the um, the findings in the in the navigator. So welcome everybody. Welcome to our panelists. Thank you for joining me, and thank you to those of you who are joining us from uh, where, wherever you are. I want to start, if I may, uh, by shooting a question at you, Yurt, um, and. Um, you know, Yurt is it's one of the few people who've had the courage to actually read the security navigator from uh, from end to end. Um, and uh, I, I asked him, Yurt, you know, what what do you think the, the the key themes are? What are the things in the report that kind of really stood out uh, to you and and you think are worth paying attention to? Well, allow me to elaborate a little bit more on the 180 pages of the security navigator, because I was looking at uh, the release and it, this is the fifth release of our security navigator and the total of pages has increased from 72 <laughs> to 94 to 96, 126 and 180 pages big. So it, it's almost like a book. And I think uh, the security navigator should be treated with a holistic approach and not as silos, uh, such as looking and reading chapters from a book. When you correlate all those chapters, uh, you see a big picture and it will basically uh, show the client or organizations and attack surface how it looks like in the real world. And to be sure, the security navigator doesn't uh, give you quick and easy answers what's going on, but it provides you insights what is happening and what the criminals and nation states are actually doing. To continue on the highlights, it's uh, we have many topics. Uh, you can read it as a book, uh, not in a weekend and or in a couple of days. You need to take the time of it, but it will sure interest you. Um, the first topic uh, that is very interesting is cyber extortion. Uh, what we have seen in the past of the years and where our security researchers were looking for that how the um, cyber extortion market is evolving and also is changing. Um, in, looking back in the past, it was directed at a single factor and now it's multi-factor. It's focused on big companies to, to gain and, uh, money from it. Um, we are discussing also the multi-domain battlefield and what does that includes? That includes the physical and cyber battlefields that are actually happening. We have seen the war going on with Russia and Ukraine, and you see a combination of digital and physical attacks supporting and complementing each other. But what does it mean for you as a country that is like miles away from Ukraine or Russia? Uh, you could see, okay, well, I, I don't care because the missile won't won't uh, reach me. But digital attacks can do. Uh, it can happen that collateral damage is actually damaging your organization. One of the components is um, of the multi-domain battlefield is cyber warfare and hacktivism. Uh, cyber warfare is 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 pushed in a further extent, as I mentioned, with Russia and Ukraine but also with uh, Israel and uh, Palestina. And there is activism as well, because you have supportive, supported uh, nation state actors that are um, uh, hacking uh, Western governments uh, to, to, to get them on the knees actually. Um, last, one of the most important and interesting topics is the operation of technology. And what we see in the ever evolving threat landscape 
is that the criminals or the nation states are always looking for the shortest route to uh, the organization. And as we as a, as, as a defender, we are on cyber defense, we try to defend and protect companies at the highest level. When it's get to, getting too difficult for a um, criminal actor or the nation states, they move on. And that's the ever evolving threat landscape. So they are moving from the IT that we used to be, they're moving to operational technology. So they are also touching new businesses, new branches, such as a pharmaceutical organizations or manufacturing. And last but, lo last but not least is the regional and industry insights. And this is an important component. We are an international organization and we are therefore started to give insights in the more local aspects and threats that are happening uh, in some countries and, uh, and and the world as well. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jot. You know, um, my my team and I spend a lot of time and put a lot of effort into thinking about how we organize the navigator. Um, and and part of the reason is, as you said, is that um, you know you, you, you want to create chapters or sections that relate to a topic or a theme that may be interesting to someone in particular but but increasingly these themes and topics are 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 impossible to tease apart you know that they, they, they all um, kind of touch on each on each other and so there's also these threads that uh, that that run across them uh, and that makes it hard to um, put a report like this together and 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 also means that for readers you kind of need to do both you know you you, you kind of want to look at a, at a chapter and 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 consider what it says about a specific theme but you also kind of have to stand back and look at what the um, transversal themes are that that run through the whole report um but Jyot, I wanted to ask you in particular, um, so you and another friend of ours, uh, Tamara, um, contributed to a, a chapter that we included in the Navigator this year about cyber warfare in particular, which is one of the themes that you, you've you also highlighted there. Um, mm -hmm. And I've included here in the slide, it's just, just an excerpt from that chapter. You, you have this beautiful infographic, but also quite a comprehensive uh, discussion about what you know, cyber warfare is and how do we define it and this whole idea that uh, you mentioned of, of, you know, sort of hybrid uh, battlefields, you know, how these different aspects of warfare are interconnecting now. Um, but I wanted to ask you, you know, where does your interest in cyber warfare as a theme come from and, and why do you think it's important for our customers to, to understand the theme? Um, the interest is because uh, we live in an interconnected world. Everything is connected. As I mentioned, collateral damage can, can face or can happen to everybody. And the interest behind cyber warfare is also the geopolitical side. What is happening in an analog way could end up in a digital way uh, or in a combination of them. Um, I believe that cyber warfare will be become more and more effective for countries who want to use it because it's easy, it's stealthy and it's cheaper than to build a whole army with tanks, planes and, 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 uh, and, and, and soldiers. So you see that the, the, the start of the, actually the first actual cyber warfare uh, was Stuxnet in 2010. And we are already 14 years further, and you see mm -hmm. an increase in cyber warfare attacks around the globe. Mm -hmm. So that is also, as I said before, with the ever-evolving threat landscape, uh, it's moving on. And it's easier to infiltrate an organization or a country digitally than by the analog way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, it's increasingly a theme, isn't it? And it, I think it's very clear to um, you know strategists that that cyber is a mechanism that they can use in political in deploy in political conflict. Um, but I guess it's still something of an evolving space in terms of what the what the right way is to use it. 
you know, whether that's in support of kinetic effects, whether that's focused on, you know, morale and spreading fear, uncertainty and doubt, whether it's about misinformation, disinformation, intelligence gathering. And I suppose all of these things kind of converge. Um, and I think the point you're making is that um, when, when warfare or geopolitical conflict extends to include cyber, then everyone who's in the digital space becomes a participant, right? Every business, every server, every user now becomes part of the, um, of the battlefield, whether they're directly involved in that conflict or, uh, or not. Yo, thanks for that. Um, Simon, I wanted to ask you a question also, um, like you're, you're a strategic advisor and I know you spend a lot of your time, uh, you know, face to face with, with clients advising them on, you know, architecture, strategy, governance, technology choices, uh, et cetera. Um, and obviously one of our goals in producing the navigator is to make it useful to, to you and your clients. Um, can I ask you, when you're talking to clients, what's your advice to them on how they use and get value from the report? Um, oh, well, uh, I think uh, there are many different ways that security navigator can be used uh, by our clients. Um, in my role as strategic advisor, um, I provide high level advice and um, I use the security navigator as one of my sources, uh, actually my most important source. And um, I have been called uh, over the years by various clients in different sectors uh, with um, a different range of challenges. Uh. Challenges going from uh, raising security awareness over understanding the road threat landscape, how we can uh, be more efficient and effective uh, up to um, uh, making you business cases for um, uh, investments in cybersecurity. And um, I do recall one uh, customer uh, that uh, called me uh, a few months ago. Um, and this was a customer within finance and insurance. Huh? And they have quite a large IT and security team with various roles in there, huh? from administrators over uh, people on the, on the support desk, programmers, and so on. Um, and they all have a very specific um, uh, specialty uh, to do their job, but uh, they do not always have uh, all a view on uh, the complete cyber threat landscape. And for that reason, uh, this uh, organization in finance and insurance, they organize uh, on a regular basis calls uh, to share um, information about cyber threats. And for them, um, we use the security navigator to pick out uh, information from uh, finance and insurance. And we uh, organized um, a call uh, sharing that information. So they uh, use that to keep their people, uh, or to use that uh, to keep their people and cyber on top of their mind uh, when they, uh, so they are able to proactively identify and react to uh, cyber threats. Uh, it helps them in uh, making uh, decisions uh, when uh, they are doing their daily job. It's a nice example of how the security navigator can be used um, uh, for many customers. Uh, and another interesting case uh, I recall is um, the uh, an IT director of a local government. And he called me uh, last year. Uh, he and his team were evaluating to implement a CyberSoc. So being able in their environment to detect cyber threats in an early stage. Uh, and they were convinced they needed it. Um, however, they had to go to the town council and uh, need to get approval for the budget and um, uh, the resources they required uh, to implement the CyberSoc. So what we did was uh, took some numbers, facts and figures to support the business case. And uh, uh, eventually uh, this uh, IT director got approval to continue uh, the project and the service. Thanks, Simon. Um, you're not gonna be expecting this question. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> put you on the spot. Um, I want you to imagine that you've got, say, five minutes with a mm -hmm. with a CISO, um, mm -hmm. and the CISO says, "Look, Simon, here's this report. Um, what's in it that's uh, that's important to me?" 
Mm -hmm. uh, what what would you say to a to a CISO in a situation like that? Okay, um, well, Charles, in first place, uh, I, I I do like to understand uh, what type of organization the CISO is working at, um, what are the specific challenges? Because in Security Navigator, there is information for various sectors, um, so I like to fine tune that because. Some uh, research might um, be more interesting for specific organizations uh, where other uh, organizations uh, might not uh, experience the same potential impact. Uh, hacktivism is a, is a nice example of that. But um, if I need to look at, um, at the bigger picture and what's uh, applicable for everybody, then it would be in first place cyber extortion. Uh, because cyber extortion is on the rise for many years, uh, and they may, they remain making a record number of uh, victims. Now, one thing was quite um, remarkable last year. Um, that was uh, one specific uh, threat actor named Klopp, and Klopp managed multiple times uh, to exploit a zero day, making a tremendous amount of uh, victims uh, uh, at the same time and, and in a very short. Uh, period of time. So basically, every CISO should um, realize that uh, cyber criminals uh, have both uh, uh, means and motivations, uh, and the cyber extortion threat will remain increasing over time. And that will be out there as long as uh, businesses have uh, digital assets. Uh, so uh, the cyber extortion uh, threat remains uh, rising. And then um, I mentioned uh, zero day exploits uh, used by Klopp, um, managing zero day exploits and the vulnerabilities uh, uh, linked to those uh, exploits uh, is quite hard, it's uh, challenging. Uh, but at the same time, it is also quite challenging to deal with known vulnerabilities. Um, and in the Security Navigator, there is a quite interesting section uh, about uh, the use of intelligence as part of vulnerability management strategies. Huh? Uh, the context may vary depending on type of organization, type of assets you have, and so on. But um, we see that uh, on average, huh, uh, organizations only manage to patch 15% of the new uh, discovered vulnerabilities while 5% is actually effectively exploited by uh, cyber threat actors. So uh, intelligence uh, can help, uh, although it's not a magic and silver bullet, um, but it can help uh, to uh, improve uh, the strategy on, uh, cyber, uh, on, on vulnerability management. And then lastly, I think uh, talking to CISOs and other people within the security um, uh, sector, uh, that um, proving return on investment on the investments being done uh, to improve cybersecurity is uh, quite challenging. And um, it is not expressed in the security navigator, but there are two interesting sections, uh, one about uh, the cyberstock and another one uh, from our pen testers, where uh, we can see over time uh, improvements. Uh, for example, uh, in here you see uh, results from the time spent by our pen testers, and uh, they actually have to work harder uh, the last year than they had to do, to do, do a few years ago. So uh, uh, it is showing that uh, investing in cybersecurity is actually paying off. Uh, some good news for a change. So thanks. Um, yeah, there's a lot in the report. I think those three themes are uh, are important. Um, and and the and the last one you mentioned this uh, you know positive ROI on security. And I always find it funny. And and with and with all respect to the team in the studio, you know the, the marketing teams want us to uh, highlight threats and challenges and and bad news. But there is actually there is actually positive news, and I think this you know this chart which which shows that it it actually has become harder over time, seen from at least one perspective. It's become harder over time for hackers to compromise systems. is is positive. It shows that when we do things right, it actually does uh, does make a difference. I want to show you another slide from the report uh, on the topic of. Uh, ROI, it's the uh, this threat detection maturity wave. Um, 
And this chart shows how our efficiency in detecting threats improves over time as we invest in and develop a detection uh, program, I guess, together with our, our clients. Um, to tell us a little bit about this and what it says about uh, security and ROI. Um, so, so here, uh, the threat detection uh, maturity wave uh, coming from our cyber sub customers. Um, what it actually tells us, um, if we if we look to a period of uh, three years, uh, then we see that 60% of our customers managed to get an efficiency on their true positives uh, uh, of uh, 30%. Uh, if we look to customers that have um, cyber sub services for over four years, we see even uh, an improvement up to 45 percent um and over time eh, when when we start working uh, together with the customer uh, to detect cyber threats in their environment uh, we actually see uh, waves of this uh, efficiency yeah? uh, at the beginning of uh, the contract uh, we see uh, that the efficiency rate on the true positives uh, is, is quite low, uh, uh, about 9%. We start to add uh, at that moment with uh, analyzing logs like uh, firewall logs, Active Directory, Syslog, Syslog logs, and so on. And quickly, uh, we see an improvement in the efficiency rate. Um, uh, of course, uh, for our customers, we keep the false positives low. <clears throat> Because uh, our security uh, analysts uh, uh, filter them out for, uh, for for our customers before, um, and so so we work mainly on the true positives. Uh, but once we have done the first cycle uh, uh, with adding those uh, logs, uh, we start to add additional logs and more logs to get in more information. And what happens then is that the efficiency rate uh, immediately drops uh, once again, but quickly starts to improve. Um, improve uh, as we start fine-tuning uh, those log sources and those uh, detection capabilities we have. And then after some time, uh, uh, we go through uh, an additional round where we add uh, even more log sources. And then there is once again uh, a dip, but um, it goes up uh, once more uh, up to 40% uh, 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 by uh, the end of uh, the wave. And the most important here uh, is, Charles, that um, uh, that's what we see and that what we know from our uh, security analysts, that, is, that it is important that we get a, a very good closed feedback loop about what we're detecting. Uh, so getting information uh, from our customers, uh, what we have seen, uh, is this correct? Uh, do we need to know uh, additional things uh, to then uh, uh, improve um, uh, the service and the uh, efficiency rate? Uh, of the two positives. So uh, over time, uh, this high efficiency, uh, it results actually in a better ROI of the investments uh, being done in cybersecurity. Yeah, it's, 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 I find this very interesting. I, I've looked at this data myself a lot. Um, and as you say, there's, you know, on average, only 19% of incidents that are detected by our cyber socks end up being confirmed security incidents. Um, and and it, it it seems like the more telemetry you have, the, the worse that number um, mm. becomes until you go through this cycle, until you go through this matura you know, maturation cycle. Um, and then, you know, as this chart shows, by the time uh, you've gone through these different phases, um, in collaboration with the with the consumer of the service, uh, you end up with like a four times higher efficiency uh, rate. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems to be one of those sort of um, immutable laws of uh, of security. You know, false positives are going to grow faster than true positives as uh, the wider you you look, and you have to constantly work to recreate that that uh, that balance. Um, I want to, if I may, uh, ask our attendees if, if we could get an opinion from them. We want to share a quick poll um, just to uh, break the ice a little bit um, and ask the people that are attending, if you don't mind sharing with us um, what sorts of themes and top topics uh, you find interesting in reports like this um, and what you would like to uh, see more of. If you don't mind to just 
just take a minute and, and select one of the, the, the topics or themes. You know, which of these things do you think is, uh, is valuable and important to you? Um, and while that's happening, I want to place a question to your, to you and perhaps Simon, if you have an opinion on this also. Uh, it's from one of the attendees, Elka. Um, and, and she's, she, she's asking, I think, uh, about something you said, Simon, about awareness, about creating awareness using the report. Could you, um, maybe starting with you, Yurt, what I mean, what do you mean by that? How do you generate awareness from a report like this? Um, as I said before, you, you should uh, treat the security navigator as a book. It's a story. It describes all the facts and issues that are around in the digital era. Um, Organizations are struggling to find the right path, uh, the right method to become more secure and resilient against cyber attacks these days. So it, it's, it's, it gives them good understanding from what's happening and what they could be facing in the near future. Um, because uh, everything that is connected can be hacked, uh, basically. Uh, maybe you can elaborate on that, Simon, as well. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, um, and, and one of the things I see happening uh, a lot uh, is that, yeah, um, many, many organizations and people working in that organization um, uh, struggle to uh, uh, distinguish uh, uh, what is actually a threat and, and what is not. And sometimes even forgetting uh, about other threats that are also out there. So um, uh, raising awareness uh, uh, with the security navigator uh, is something we do with um, yeah, selecting information uh, that is uh, or se selecting uh, research information that is uh, linked to a specific sector and then um, dive a little bit deeper into that, tell what is behind it, uh, what has been the impact on other types of organizations doing uh, exactly uh, the same type of activities um, to help them then uh, uh, define uh, and, 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 and make the people in the organization uh, take that as a consideration uh, with them in their daily job uh, if they have to make specific decisions um, uh, they know that and they are aware about uh, the actual threat that is out there. All right. So, yeah, so, so it's less about creating, uh, you know, I suppose fear or um, anxiety. So it's, it's about, try, yeah, it's trying to, to, to paint a picture of what's actually mm -hmm. happening. Um, yeah. And, and using that as a way to uh, to determine your strategy and your priorities, et cetera. Um, so the poll is in. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions. Um, it's actually surprisingly uh, balanced. Uh, once again, most people are interested in vulnerability management, uh, which is which is what something we see incidentally for those of you who responded across the board. It, it really is a pressing issue, and it's it's one of the reasons we're we're so interested in in studying it. Um, but almost an equal distribution across uh, all of the all of the themes. Um, thank thank you everyone for contributing to that. It is very useful to us. I I want to remind attendees that um, we are open to take questions. And uh, and to please share your questions with us in the in the chat uh, in the questions in the questions window, so I, I can um, pass them on to our various experts. Um, and for the for the panelists, uh, there, there is a few questions that have already come in that are um, that are on a similar theme. Um, the one question speaks about our industry view on threats and incidents, and the other question speaks to our regional view um, on threats and incidents. Um, and I'm trying to think how I can how I can frame these these questions because they're both quite 
difficult. This is from you, Patrick, and from you, um, Thomas. And I, I think what I'm what I might do is suggest that Patrick and Thomas, we can come back to you with specific um, detailed answers to your questions. But I'd, I'd like to comment on on how and why we collect regional and um, industry data. And the first thing, uh, Th Thomas and Patrick, to to understand is that um, the data sources we use are quite different. Uh, and so in some cases, we we can derive, I think, a really relevant regional or industry perspective. And in other cases, uh, it's much harder. Um, and one of the challenges for us as an industry is to figure out when regional and industry perspectives are actually important or not. Um, and so perhaps, Diana, I can, I can pull you in here because um, you know one of the places that we try and derive industry and regional uh, perspectives is in uh, activism and in cybercrime, right? Uh, and cyber extortion. Um, so maybe you can just briefly explain to us, like, how do we how do we figure out the regions uh, for cyber extortion and for hacktivism? Um, and what you know, what can we deduce from from looking at the at the regions for those two uh, forms of crime? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. I've, I I saw the question this way. I've been thinking yeah. about it a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we collect, you know, we collect regions and industries from, from both, really. I mean, from what we're seeing in our customers, because, you know, we have, of course, that metadata, so we can, you know, look at the incident data that we see at our customers and we classify them, you know, from which industries are they and from which regions are they, where, they, where are they headquartered. Uh, and the same we do for the threat landscape. And we have quite good insights into cyber extortion or hacktivism just to see who's impacted the most and you know can can we see a pattern or not and here we really try to to use industry classifications for example that um, that are widely used you know our industry loves to to come up with uh, their own terms their own names their own uh, definitions so it's it's quite a challenge for us to to make you know the data that we work with either the threat data or you know our cyberstock data or customer data um, to make that comparable to actually have something to say on that matter. So, um, yeah, and I think, you know, we personally, we receive the question a lot from, from our customers, what do you see that matter to me? You know, and I think industry classification and region is uh, is very useful uh, to, to give, to give uh, you know, a threat uh, picture of what potentially could could hit that customer on it. Yeah, and I'm yes. seeing actually the, the regions right now uh, on the screen as well. This is cyber extortion, just to, to place you uh, what we're looking at, uh, the threat of cyber extortion and uh, what we've been monitoring the past 12 months uh, or the last 24 months, basically, and seeing the change of the past 12 months. So one of the questions, Diana, I think was specifically to this point, um, and it was about the the uh, I think the APAC, the Asian region, um, and and whether you know whether we have sufficient insight to actually draw conclusions about these mm. about these regional shifts. Uh, you know, is this, for example, mm. shaped by what our customer base looks like uh, in a case like this, or is it an objective view of how how you know cyber extortion is is represented yeah. across different regions yeah okay i see i see where you're going um yeah i mean again then it depends on what data we're looking at so for, for me what i'm you know what, what my themes are and what my research focus is is the threat landscape so i think there we are uh, quite unbiased in that sense because we are observing the threat as a whole uh, and, and looking at all regions that are infected so for cyber extortion as we can see now on the screen or uh, for hacktivism we see that when we have actually noticed you know south southeast asia to be 
um, much more over average. So they have seen an increase for the last two years at least, now, where we see Brazil and Mexico, for example, most, most uh, sorry, that was Latin America, um, Thailand and uh, Malaysia and so on, uh, more impacted. Um, but we have been arguing in the past that, of course, we see a barrier in language, you know. So when it comes to uh, to other points of collection where we can have access to data that we can collect, we might actually face, uh, you know, language barriers, for example. We also think the victimology is determined by that, that threat actors face the same language barrier. And that is maybe a reason why we don't see the Middle East or Asia so much impacted yet. Um, but I guess technology will, will help with that in the very near future. Yeah, the, 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 with the AI and translation tools. Mm -hmm. I want to show you another slide, uh, Diana. Um, it's slide number 64 for the studio, which it shows the, um, the industry breakdown of cyber extortion. Yeah, that's the one. Um, and one of the questions was specifically our observations around um, incidents in, in, in manufacturing. Uh, I can't remember who asked this uh, question, it was either Patrick or Thomas, but um, I, I just wanted to clarify for attendees, this chart, for example, is, a, is derived from a global view of reported cyber extortion or ransomware incidents. So as Diana was saying, this data we're pretty confident reflects exactly what's happening just like the regional shift in cyber extortion does where we reflect data that's specific to our clients like i think there was a question about you know how many vulnerabilities do we see or how many incidents do we detect in our cyber socks there we do of course have a kind of observer bias right if if we don't have many clients in manufacturing we won't see so much in manufacturing but we do wherever we can try and adjust those perspectives for the size of our of our customer base. Um, but sticking with this, Diana, I'd be interested to hear um, the, about your thoughts on the prominence of manufacturing in this graph, because we see manufacturing prominently here. We see manufacturing prominently, obviously, in uh, our OT attack data. We see manufacturing prominently in our Cybersoft data. Uh, do you have a perspective on why the manufacturing industry features so heavily in in our reports? Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a really good question. You know, we've been seeing them ever since. You know, we're tracking cyber extortion as a crime since 2020, so f four years in, uh, over 10,000 victims, and we see you know manufacturing at least 20% or more representing. Uh, you know, the top one industry impacted by cyber extortion. Um, and the reason why is very difficult because, you know, the reporting of such incidents isn't mandatory or wanted. Uh, it's more like almost of, of a shame to, to admit that you have become a victim, but we could actually learn so much from that. Uh, and of course, we have theories why manufacturing might be more impacted. Um, you know, one of them is that maybe we we just have a lot of manufacturers out there. Um, so, if, you know, if you look at this from very zoomed out version, uh, the other theory is, of course, that manufacturing is maybe not as mature uh, in regards of, you know, cybersecurity practices. Um, and I think here it's also important to know that we're looking at IT uh, incidents in manufacturing and uh, not OT, um, you know, the data that we're collecting for cyber extortion. So it's, it's very difficult and we are, you know, we are collecting sub industry exactly for that question. So we, we're not looking just at um, yeah, the high level. Okay, this is coming from the manufacturing. We're also looking at what type of manufacturing is mostly impacted. But even there, we have data, we have that knowledge, but it doesn't give us a sense of why. Uh, well, it doesn't give us an answer to, to why those specific sub industries are impacted. Manufacturing. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Jan. I want to I want to keep you on the line for a little bit because I have another question for you. But <coughs> excuse me, just just to round this off uh, for the questions regarding industry and regional insights. It is very clear to us that certain industries, like manufacturing, are impacted more than others, and it's certainly clear to us that we see shifting patterns in which regions are impacted. Mm. To Diana's point it's not always clear why that is. 
what we do feel strongly about is that we shouldn't jump to the conclusion that those patterns are a reflection of the attacker's intent. In other words, we shouldn't automatically assume that manufacturing is being impacted more because, uh, because criminals favor attacking manufacturing. We should at least be open to the idea that those industries or regions are being impacted more because of other environmental factors like the kinds of technology they use, like uh, their willingness to pay, like, uh, as Diana said, probably the first point is the, their level of maturity. Um, and the other factor, when it comes to, you know, the patterns we see, is what the regulatory and law enforcement impacts or responses are uh, with regards to the industries and regions that get hit. So we have, for example, in the past seen criminal actors staying away from uh, you know, hospitals or healthcare because it was politically very um, sensitive, right? They didn't want to evoke a strong law enforcement or regulatory a response by hitting victims that were considered, uh, if you like, out of out of play. Um, and so, um, Diana uh, Olivier, for example, asks about education. You know, do, what do we see with regards to education, and and how do we how do we explain that in our in our data? The industry education. Yeah, the industry education. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, it's really hard to explain why you know why they impact edu education. We've noticed uh, we've noticed a huge increase in education, especially uh, universities or colleges, especially based in the US as well. Um, why that is is again something where that we could argue the victim variables. They are maybe more perceptible for this type of crime. Uh, so if we look at maturity, um, or even you know, do they have funds maybe to to pay so the the potential or the possibility to pay for the threat actor seems uh, big enough to, to impact them. Mm. I also think that there could be other factors like um, you know maybe uh, as when someone was talking about Klopp in the beginning you know Klopp discovered and if you like perfected or mastered using a specific vulnerability which turned out to have a supply chain impact and so really it wasn't Klopp's intent to impact a specific industry, but rather that industry was more uh, dependent on a particular technology, which turned out to be vulnerable and, and exploited. Uh, so we try and in the navigator, we try and be, be nuanced about that. Um, and that I know can make it sometimes con confusing to understand, you know, why we see what we do, but it's not always clear. Um, but John, I want to go back to a previous point uh, that I was making about the political implications of targeting decisions and this mm -hmm. idea that threat actors would uh, avoid regions or industries or businesses because they don't want to be to 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 raise their profile too much. And of mm -hmm. course, recently we had the whole uh, the whole saga around. Um, Lockbit and the and the takedown of Lockbit and before that it was uh, it was Black Hat that uh, you know got taken down uh, by by law enforcement. Can you can you tell us a little bit about those um, those kinds of law enforcement efforts to counter cybercrime and um, you know what we observe there? And, and for the studio, I think we've got a we've got a slide here. It's uh, I don't know where you want to go, Diana. Slide uh, yeah, nineteen maybe. Agree. Mm, thinking a little bit because you know what what are you saying that they they've been you know historically been trying to to avoid uh, big targets because we've seen actually like with colonial pipeline and Casilla that it, it attracts too much attention and it actually wears consequences um, and then they have their own rules that they don't want to uh, or promise not to attack critical infrastructure or healthcare for example but you know it feels like it, it has been changing actually since you know since 2022 we've actually seen them become more political um and 
not purely financially motivated anymore and e even more more bold uh, and you know you've just mentioned yeah. the law the, the most recent law enforcement um efforts to disrupt this ecosystem and it's been so fascinating to you know to observe that space uh and you know before uh black cat was attempted to be disrupted and before lockbit three now uh, in february we wrote this chapter in the navigator uh, and we we tried to actually track the law enforcement activities that generally tries to disrupt uh, cybercrime in all kinds of forms. Uh, and uh, yeah. we couldn't really find any, you know, uh, source. So we created our own data set on that, where we look at announcements by law enforcement, media coverage that announces a action, a law enforcement action. Uh, and here we look at the type of actions that they have been taking, but also what we're looking at right now at the screen, um, the type of crime that was addressed. And we can actually see, you know, if we zoom zoom out, uh, we can see that the space has become a bit more busy, like by the end of 2022. Um, and uh, yeah, in 2023. And we actually also see that cyber extortion is the most, most addressed. Uh, crime by 15% and then followed by, I think it was hacking, crypto and fraud. Um, what, uh, what is interesting is that, you know, if we, if we ask the question whether or not it has been effective, um, we actually need to say, like, if we look, look at this from like, just looking at the activities that we can observe and the victim numbers that seem to be rising, we haven't actually seen any effect to that. And um, in order to try to explain why that is, we would have to look, I think, in two, two sides of a coin, let's say. So the first side is, you know, what, what, is, what is a disruption effort and, and by whom? So we've seen government uh, activities, we've seen law enforcement quite, um, yeah, quite actively trying uh, to disrupt them uh, and not succeeding, unfortunately. Uh, Lockbit, you know, came, came back uh, very quickly after. Black Cat, Black, Black Cat came back uh, very quickly after. So it's, very, it's a very bold move right now. Um, and they're being extremely resistant, not just resi resilient, but also resistant and showing like, nope, we're not gonna be stopped. Uh, we're not gonna go down, um, you know, in silence and rebranding and coming back in one way or another. Maybe they might in the future, but they actually remaining and unseeing themselves uh, publicly uh, and just remaining uh, operations. So then the question is, okay, let's look at the ecosystem. What what are the challenges here? And you know, we did an analysis in the Navigator, and I think we have a slide for that, uh, where we look at um, ransomware cyber extortion. Slide twenty one, um, is it? Um, yeah, exactly that one. So, you know, we're observing this type of activity for a long time and we've looked then at uh, the lifespan, so to say, and also, you know, how much is it changing? So if you look to the left and you see the two bashers, what we're looking at is actually, um, who do we see in, in 2022 that actually was also active the year before? Um, and who do we don't see any longer? Uh, and who do we see new? And the same also for 2023. Who has been active in the last 12 months and is still, you know, active? Uh, who has uh, closed shops? Uh, and um, who have we seen new? So we see a lot of activity, especially in 2023. You know, after 2022, we saw a decrease because now we know, you know, the Ukraine war actually um, dis disrupted this ecosystem or distracted that ecosystem a little bit. And 2023 just came back in full force. Um, and we see new, uh, a lot of new act actors joining that. Uh, we see still almost the same amount of groups remaining in that space, but then also we see uh, a lot uh, closing shop. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just a very flexible ecosystem. And then if you look to the right, we actually just investigated a little bit, how long do those operations last? Uh, how long are they online before they yeah go yeah, offline for, yeah, for long? Yeah. Um, exactly. Uh, and here we see that, you know, over half of them, 54% actually only last six months or less. Uh, so, you know, when, when we as defenders, when law enforcement, when governments uh, realize that they, you know, those groups are an issue, uh, then they are already long gone uh, and come back mm -hmm. under different uh, names. So that is a challenge for sure. 
Thanks, thanks, Diana. There's there's another question uh, around uh, the stats from from Raymond and Raymond. I'll try and bat this one for you quickly, and then uh, in the interest of time, I, I need to move on. You know, Raymond asks, um, you know, given this uncertainty about what the stats mean, what's what's their value? Um, well, Raymond, I, I would argue as as a researcher, there's there's two things. The the first is sometimes it's good to know what we don't understand um, and to disprove things. Right. So it's an it's an iterative process, but we, but we learn every time we examine and and test hypotheses against the numbers. But concretely, right now, if we're talking about you know major um, threats like cyber extortion and hacktivism, I would say there is, um, there's three things we can take away. The first is both of those forms of threat are growing. Um, secondly, they are resistant to the traditional kind of go-to controls that, uh, you know, that we want to put in place. And thirdly, that um, they are generally opportunistic. So you can't hide behind being in an unimportant industry, being in a small country, uh, being outside of the West, not speaking English, or um, you know, being a small business. These uh, these crimes are, um, yeah, they, they 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 can and probably will affect everyone. Um, I want to stick with the theme of trends. Um, but I want to jump over to you, if I may, uh, Simone. Um, and for the studio, if we could go to slide number 22, um, there's, a, there's a section in the navigator that speaks about OT, uh, OT security. Um, and it, it's, it's quite a remarkable section for us because it, attracted a lot of attention after we published the Navigator. Since publishing that part of the report, uh, you know, we've been invited to speak at the, at the RSA conference in San Francisco, at the SANS ICS summit in, uh, in London, and at Insomniac in, in Switzerland. And it's the chapter that explores, I guess, the past and the future of um, OT incidents, right? So incidents that affect operational technology um, in environments. And I think, Stu, we can go to the next slide because I want to show you this chart, Simone, and ask your opinion on it. Um, the slide shows uh, analysis over 35 years of um, cybersecurity incidents that have impacted OT environments. Um, and then looks at who was responsible, what kinds of techniques they used, what kinds of technology they impacted, and where in the OT stack they impacted that technology. Uh, Simon, talk us through this and, 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 and what this finding implies. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for asking. Great question. So um, we see that um, our study is um, data-related, um, unbiased, so we can say after 35 years of cyber attacks that um, impact OT is that the OT environments are being impacted by cyber criminals specifically for ransomware, but that is why attacks impacting the IT systems. And it's still the case that it's more the IT uh, systems that are attacked, not OT. So a major reason that we don't see criminals attacking and compromising OT from ransom is that there is no um, viable way to execute extortion and monetize the attack. So if and when that changes, we should anticipate that the criminals that are already attacking IT for rents will also start attacking OT. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. And, and Raymond, to your question, this, this is a good example of where stats can help us. So if we look historically, what we're seeing is that where an attack has an impact on OT, not exclusively, but predominantly, it wasn't actually the OT that was attacked, it was the IT that was attacked. And it predominantly wasn't attacked by a nation state or a hacktivist, it was attacked by a cyber criminal for the purpose of cyber extortion, of ransomware. And it's that knock-on effect that Yot uh, was talking about earlier, 
that then ends up impacting production and our ability to produce things and runs our factories and stuff. But Simon, the, the, the report then goes on to say, well, if that's what it's been like at the past, in the past, the, um, the, the question is, will criminals find a way to monetize and benefit from attacks against OT? And that's not, that's not entirely simple, right? Because traditional ransomware where you exfiltrate data and encrypt things doesn't translate into OT. It's not traditional computers, you know, that you can encrypt and exfiltrate data from. And that's then when we, um, where we introduce the idea of dead man's PLC. And again, I think we've got a slide for it, the next slide, 24. Simon, could you just talk us briefly through what dead man's PLC is and why it's, uh, why it's important? Yes. Um... Deadman's PLC starts at the engineering workstation, so coming from the um, IT and the assets where the um, engineers will create configuration and load them onto PLCs across the OT environment. So if a criminal would come into the system, then um, they would try to um, manipulate, manipulate something on the engineering workstation so they can view existing live PLC code and then they can uh, project files, edit them, download them, new configuration to the PLC. PLC. And we think that um, the Deadman's PLC is an effective and pragmatic technique for holding the anti-operational process to ransom. So if they would, um, they would come um, maybe with PLC attack, um, ransom it. Most importantly, the Deadman's PC acts as a starting point. So for defenders to rethink the risk, ransomware and SIEX, so they could um, expose also to OT beyond the current search of IT TTPs and type 1A SIEX um, we see today. Um, so um, ransomware does not work in the cyber physical um, world because data exfiltration and encryption simply don't translate it to OT, but that could change in the future. Thanks, Juan. I think this is a, it's a really good example of where, you know, looking back at the stats uh, presents us with a picture of what is, um, which is that actually OT environments are not being hit so often, but allows us then to consider what is going to happen and start preparing for that uh, and I think the concern we see there is that a viable cyber crime model business model will emerge from attacking OT and dead man's PLC demonstrates how that could work um, and that as you say that would represent a real watershed moment for OT security where suddenly OT security becomes uh, a valuable and attractive uh, attractive target um, Folks, we've gone, we've gotten to the end of our time, um, but there's one more question which I'd love to try and address for you, Catherine. And this is a question that I think is um, is, is is best suited for it's best suited for you, um, and it's on the theme of vulnerability management, which is which is obviously something that's of interest to many people, um, and it's it speaks to the question of how we prioritize vulnerabilities uh, and I think it was Simon in the beginning who was pointing out that you know we know that only five four five percent of all registered vulnerabilities actually end up getting exploited in the wild um, but we also know that our customers generally can't patch more than about 15 percent of known vulnerabilities. Yeah. And so the challenge is really how do you determine uh, how you spend your patching resources, your, your vulnerability mitigation resources to most effectively deal with those vulnerabilities that are going to uh, impact you the worst. Uh, and you know, there's these various tools now, the CVSS rating system, EPSS for uh, exploit Protection, this pen testing, you know, there's all, all these things. What are you guys saying to your customers about, um, about how we address that problem, which is also highlighted in the Navigator? Yeah, thanks, Charles. Um, and that's definitely a brilliant question from the uh, audience. So from, my, from our perspective, CVSS is still the go-to for everyone when it comes to the initial scoring of a vulnerability. Um, it is still used by 99% of scanners to show where the vulnerability sits within the severity scoring and provide that first initial insight. Um, EPSS can then help the customer prioritise this to be specific to their environment 
based on the exploitability and focus initially in patching the vulnerabilities that could be exploited. Um, we also use our World Watch service that all managed service customers have access to, advising us of the most critical vulnerabilities in the wild. This helps us to be proactive when the likes of Log4j and the recent Evarenty Zero Day happen. Another way we could look at it though is actually there's no one answer to that question. Um, there's a lot it depends on and that is the main thing is what intelligence is being used for. So risk mitigation reduces the risk overall and threat mitigation is about responding to something current and specific. These are the two objectives that customers really need to be pursuing in their environment. As shown in the on the diagram on the slide, this requires different strategies, metrics and tactics. This involves applying attack intelligence, vulnerability intelligence and threat intelligence differently. But regardless of what threat intelligence and vulnerability intelligence is used, pursuing asset intelligence is always key. Customers need to know what assets they have in their environment. Thanks, Kirsten. Yeah, it's, it's such a difficult question. There's a very detailed chapter in the, in the Navigator where we, we examine the effectiveness of different prioritization strategies yeah. and try and determine, you know, is there some gold standard for how do you choose how you patch? Uh, and so far, you know, we, we, haven't, we haven't been able to find one. We're, we're still working on it. Uh, but I think what you say is key is that the starting point is, you know, which is the specific problem that you're trying to solve if you're going to use intelligence to make decisions what is your intelligence question first uh, and then as you're saying if you don't if you don't know what you have if you don't know where that is then you know understanding the the the, the, the threats and vulnerabilities is, um, is 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 not going to be of use to you um, but folks that is all we're going to have time for um, just uh, leaves me to say thank you so much, uh, firstly to our panelists, uh, Jort, Simon, Simone, uh, Catherine, uh, really appreciate your time, always enjoy talking to you, um, to Medina and the team in the studio, slaving away, thank you very much, and then mostly to you, the, 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 the attendees that have chosen to spend this hour with us. Um, we thank you for your time, we thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, to share our thoughts and considerations with you. Um, we hope you'll take a moment to have a look at the Navigator. We hope it will be useful to you. And uh, more than anything, we, we hope to speak to you again. Um, and with that said, thanks and uh, have a wonderful day. Cybercrime is the world's third biggest economy. Every company is affected. This is big, important stuff. And nobody's taking this seriously. Jeremy, you are downloading an app. Susanna, what do you do? Jeremy, no! <laughs> How useful was it? Uh, zero use. Fun, though. Really hurt him, I think. <laughs> Orange Cyber Defense.